Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself before we get started. I'm a local historian uh, based out of Patchogue. The project I'm here to speak to you today is a little out of left field for my usual work. Um, I typically uh, focus on the convergence of women, labor, and the environment through global maritime extractive industries, specifically whaling and fishing. Um, but this work today was born out of a family history project. So I've always been very interested in the stories we are told and the stories that we choose to pass along. Uh, and I think that's what attracted me to family history research in general. So through this project, I've really been able to dig into researching what life was like for women in large Eastern metropolitan areas during the world wars uh, by looking at my great grandmother's participation in the radium industry. So this has been a very interesting journey for me and I am so excited to bring you all along with me. So I've included here an outline so you could see a roadmap of where my talk will be going tonight. We'll start out by introducing my great grandmother, Marion Murdoch O'Hara. I'll take you through the uses of radium in the early 1900s and the beginning of the radium dial painting industry. We'll cover radium poisoning, uh, the resulting lawsuits and the aftermath of the radium dial painting industry. Uh, we'll finish up with some remarks on the legacy of this work and on my own family's history. So I'd like to set the scene for us tonight. On February 27th, 1905, Marion Murdoch O'Hara was born in New York. And this was in New York City. She was the daughter of two immigrants. Her father, George P. O'Hara, had immigrated to the United States from Liverpool, and he'd found work in New York City as a janitor. Her mother, Marion Dunlop, was a housewife from Scotland. So growing up in New York City, the younger Marion lived with her parents and her two sisters. At age 17, she married Eden J. Barrett, a 23-year-old immigrant from Newfoundland, uh, and they were married in Rutherford, New Jersey. At this point in her life, Marion was working, um, she did bit parts in silent films as a dancer, and she was really involved with that industry. She had a great deal of fun. Um, and when they met, while Marion was working as a dancer, her husband was attending college and studying to be a priest. Uh, the couple would go on to have nine children together, Rosemary, Marion, Florence, George, William, John, Patricia, Robert, and Alice. And the couple and their family lived in Mount Vernon, New York for a while, but by 1925, they had settled in the Bronx. So Marion lived in this really interesting changing world. Um, while historians usually refer to the atomic age as the era following the detonation of the first nuclear weapon at the Trinity test in 1945, one could argue that Marion came of age during this earlier radioactive craze. So radium had been discovered by Polish chemist uh, Marie Curie in 1898, and it really swept through the news and the market like a firestorm. Between 1898 and 1902, Marie Curie and her husband Pierre published 32 scientific papers one announced that when exposed to radium, diseased tumor-forming cells were destroyed faster than healthy cells. So here I have a quote from a 1925 edition of the Long Island Traveler. Uh, in 1925, the Long Island Traveler reported that the great wonders of the world are sometimes listed as the telephone, wireless telegraphy, radium, spectrum analysis, the airplane, anesthetics, and antitoxins, and x-rays. So radium was this wonder element, and it was a miracle cure for those who could afford it. It was used to treat hay fever, gout, cancer, anxiety, and so much more. Um, wealthy men and women living in the cities along the East Coast would seek out radium clinics and spas where they would go and soak in radium infused water, hoping to rejuvenate their bodies and stimulate their blood. Um, specialists knew even early on that radium could deposit in the bones and that it caused changes in the blood, but this was viewed as a positive effect at this point. And here, if we actually read the advertisement that's on our screen, people are talking about the use of radium in health. So this quote reads, avoid overwork, all other excesses, eat fresh natural, natural foods, 
breathe fresh air and drink plenty of fresh, invigorating, natural radioactive water from the Radium Spa. Here's health. So Radium was commercial dynamite. It was added to drinks, cosmetics, clothing, accessories, and more. For example, Duramod radioactive toothpaste claimed to make teeth shine brighter. Radiothor, which was a solution of radium salts, was claimed to have curative powers. Revigorator pots were ceramic water crocks lined with radioactive materials, and those actually added radon to drinking water. One advertisement for Radior Pew de Valor charged the big difference, however, lies in what this cream does for your skin and complexion. It not only softens and adds resiliency to skin and facial muscles, it not only imparts a delicate bloom to the surface, but it does what no ordinary cream can do. It energizes, invigorates, rejuvenates because it contains actual radium. That is the magic behind Radior Beauty Aids. So Radium created products which were both aesthetically pleasing and also functional and utilitarian. Uh, one contemporary writer argued that one of the big commercial uses for Radium in the United States is in the paint. Radium paint shines in the dark. Advertisements popped up in the papers for luminous house numbers like the one seen in front of us and glowing tags to label and differentiate medicines from your cleaning supplies. One advertisement in the Evening Gazette suggested, it is not enough to put poison on one shelf and non-poison on another for they can get mixed up. And then assurance becomes doubly unsure. The new little tags illuminated with an undark radium mixture that only and always glows in the dark is the safest means for pointing out medicinal dangers. Radium could be the magic fix for all problems, domestic housework issues, beauty and health. Radium paint was used for watches, clocks, ship's compasses, gun sights, aircraft flight instruments, compass dials, and more. Americans marveled at the wonder of radium watch dials. Newspapers ran articles with titles such as Your Watch a Power Plant and argued, if you own a radium dialed watch with luminous figures and hands, then you are the possessor of a vast power plant of no mean proportions, says the electrical experimenter. There is sufficient radium on your watch dial to haul your train homeward if it could be properly applied. Luminous watch dials also had these really important military applications um, and they did also increase in popularity among American civ uh, civilians as well. So where does Long Island come into this picture? How is this our local history? Well, the Radium Dial Company opened its first dial painting studio in Long Island City in 1917. In the same year, Radium Luminous Materials Corporation opened its doors in Orange, New Jersey. In New Jersey, U.S. Radium Corporation extracted and purified radium from cartonite ore sourced in Utah and Colorado to produce luminous paints marketed under the name Undark. So Marion worked at the U.S. Radium Corporation in Manhattan. She may have begun her career as a dial painter. From 1917 to 1924, approximately 800 girls worked in the New Jersey studio alone. In these dial painting studios, the girls sat in rows, dressed in their ordinary clothes and painting dials at top speed, their hands almost a blur. Each had a flat wooden tray of dials beside her. The paper dials were pre-printed on a black background, leaving the members white ready for printing. And here we can get a sense of just how close um, physically together these women were placed and also how young some of these girls were. I know if you look at this young lady all the way to the left closest to us, she, she looks quite young. It's important to note that many of these girls did lie about their ages. Um, to get employed sooner and younger. At the orange plant, dial painters mix their own luminous paint called Undark by mixing radium powder, gum arabic, and water. In Newark, Long Island City, Connecticut, and Illinois, these girls were often employed as young as 14 years old on paper. 
Um, while dial painters were encouraged to work with radium without fear and without protective equipment, the scientists and the owners of the company took a different stance to their own health. Um, these men carefully avoided exposure to the radium. This is important to note. We're going to come back to this point later on. So each dial painter mixed her own paint and used a camel hair brush to apply it to the dials. After a few strokes, the brushes would start to lose their shape, so the girls were trained to lip point, as seen in the photo before us. They were told to use their lips to shape the brushes to a point. Lip, dip, paint. Though knowing the dangers of exposure to radium, the radium company assured its dial painters that the radium ingested was not harmful to their health. Um, radium companies boasted that because radium was this wonder drug and because the girls were only exposed to a minute amount every day, their health should actually benefit from this exposure and this work environment. So Marion worked in this dial painting business for quite some time. Um, according to her son, she worked primarily as a baker, and that means that she baked the dials after they were painted in these huge industrial ovens and would later have to actually clean them out with water and hydrogen. Um, her daughter Marion worked briefly in the radium studios, but absolutely hated it. She didn't like the smell that gave her these awful headaches, and she did quit after about a week. So dial painting was this really coveted job. Um, the girls were paid piecework by the number of dials they painted. Kat Moore, the author of The Radium Girls, argues that the dial painters were ranked in the top 5% of female wage earners and on average took home $20, now uh, $370 a week. So the fastest painters could easily earn more, sometimes as much as double, giving the top earners an annual salary of $2,080, which is today's equivalent of almost $40,000. For a woman with several young children at home, Marion was likely grateful for the high wages and relative financial stability. Um, and her husband was also very active in the aircraft manufacturing business. Um, encouraged by the relative prosperity and increased demand for dial painters during the, world, during the war, Many of these young women at the factories um, were able to find dial painting jobs for themselves and also sisters, cousins, and their friends. At the end of the day, the girls went home from work and they were fairly glowing from the radium dust that had settled on their hair, skin, and clothing over the course of their work day. And many of these girls wore it as a sign of pride. So as radium was advertised to have these incredible health benefits, no one took issue with children coming into contact with it. Um, on the screen, on the left-hand side, we actually have an image of my grandfather and his twin brother. Uh, and at the end of the day, Marion, their mother, filled her pockets with the rejects, the dials with mistakes, and also radium buttons. And these were to be taken home to her children for them to play with. Radium buttons, also known as personal radioluminescent devices, glowed light green and featured a clip on the back. And that's what's shown on the right-hand side of this um, slide. These were designed for GIs to wear at night so they would be able to identify each other. According to her son, Robert, the kids had quite a great, <laughs> a great deal of fun running around with those. Um, the young boys would go off into the woods at the end of the street where the family was located in Queens. Um, and there was a creek and they would play what, what they referred to as guns, which was um, a version of war with each other and the other neighborhood kids. Um, and he shared very fond recollections of those, those memories with me um, recently when I was able to interview him. And they weren't the only children with their exposure to the radium dial painting industry. Uh, one dial painting company in New Jersey even offloaded the industrial waste from radium extraction by selling it to schools for use as playground fill um, because this byproduct looked like seaside sand. And these girls left their jobs. Um, radium dial painters had a great deal of fun they were living in New York City during the Roaring Twenties. Um, and socialization and fun were just part of working in the dial painting studios. 
The girls befriended their coworkers. They often shared candy that they kept on their work desks and ate lunch together, laughing and giggling over their workstations. Uh, especially at the studio in Ottawa, Illinois, the girls sometimes played actual games with the radium paint. They would draw mustaches and funny faces on themselves and then run upstairs into a dark room, flick off the lights and see their designs. Uh, they went out dancing after work, they invested in fashion pieces, and they enjoyed their relative prosperity as young ladies who were making quite a great deal of money um, for their age. Style painting companies often sponsored social events, especially summer picnics to build loyalty and increase employee retention. This is one of those photographs that was taken at one of those events. Um, and there is evidence of a great deal of romantic relationships that occurred between the young female dial painters and the male chemists um, within the company. But there was a very dark side to this industry. Um, very soon on, these women's bodies began to show the effects of radium poisoning and industrial disease. The young women began to develop strange sores, pimples, fatigue, stiffness in the body, terrible tooth pain, mouth odor, and facial swellings. Molly Medea, a dial painter in Newark, was the first radium girl to seek out help. Um, and she went to Dr. Neff, who was a dentist, and he diagnosed her with necrosis of the jaw after her jawbone actually broke in pieces during his examination. Dr. Neff declared that Medea was suffering from a condition not unlike phosphorus poisoning. Uh, people suffering from phosphorus poisoning are known to develop phossy jaw, and that includes tooth loss, inflammation of the gums, and pain. Phossy jaw was an occupational hazard, um, an occupational disease, which affected those who worked in the white phosphorus industry without proper safeguards. Um, and this was most commonly seen in workers in the matchstick industries during the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, other radium dial painters began to thicken, especially Irene Rudolph, Heather Quinlan, Hazel Vincent, Grace Fryer, Catherine Schwab, Quinta McDonald, and more. Um, at this point, dentists across the Eastern United States had not actually compared notes, but they began to suspect that this mysterious illness might be an occupational problem. Um, and mostly it was the dentists who were coming to these conclusions because women were seeking out dental assistance um, when they started having symptoms along the jawline. Um, at age 23, Marguerite Carlo, a dial painter in New Jersey, became the first dial painter to bring a lawsuit against the radium industry. Um, and she found a lawyer to take her case and she filed suit against the United States Radium Corporation. And unfortunately, many of these dial painters began to die very painful deaths um, they suffer from anemia, bone fractures, and necrosis of the jaw. And that's what we see on the screen as that radium jaw. Um, in many girls, this disease could take years to manifest and often came in the form of sarcoma, which is a cancer of the bone and connective tissues. Um, and it presents in this way because the body treats radium as calcium and deposits it in the bones where radioactivity can degrade marrow and mutate those bone cells. And this is a quote that I came across that I chose because I think it has a very, um, I think it is really getting at the core of the story. And at the core of the story, there is a business that's attempting to turn a profit. Um, so Genevieve Valentine wrote that the history of business is a history of violence. So most importantly, as early as 1912, the radium industry knew that handling radium could be dangerous. Uh, many of the early scientists who had handled radium had sickened and died. Antoine Becquerel, for example, had carried a small vial of radium in his waistcoat pocket, and he had reported that his skin had actually become ulcerated. Marie Curie's death uh, to aplastic anemia has also been attributed to her handling of radium. Um, watch dial companies rejected claims that the ill workers were suffering from any form of industrial disease related to their radium exposure, um, seeking to protect themselves from legal repercussions and ethical responsibilities. The radium dial company and others began medical testing of their employees. So they did not actually provide these girls with their results. 
For example, in June of 1925, 20-year-old Martine Rust of Orange, New Jersey, was found to have flushed skin and a bilateral enlargement of the thyroid gland. She had worked with US Radium Corporation as a dial painter for only a year and a half. 35-year-old Elizabeth Edwards of Nutley, New Jersey, was found to have enlarged cryptic tonsils and stiffness in her right ankle. Ms. Edwards refused to have her teeth examined, but company doctors noted that her teeth looked soft and decayed. Edwards had worked with, uh, had worked as a dial painter with US Radium Corporation for about a year and a half, and as a dial painter with Henry Bank & Co for six years before that. Um, the Radium Dial Companies even launched a smear campaign to go after the reputations of these young women and cast doubt upon the link to industrial disease. So in May of 1927, a lawsuit was filed against the U.S. Radium Corporation by a young New Jersey attorney named Raymond Berry on behalf of Miss Grace Fryer. Along with Fryer, Edna Hussman, um, Catherine Schwab, and sisters Quinta McDonald and Albina Larice joined her in the case, each asking for $250,000 in compensation. Four workers had already died before this trial. Fryer had lost all of her teeth and could not sit up without a brace. McDonald and Louise were bedridden, and by the second hearing, all of the women were too ill to attend. In November of 1928, the inventor of radium dial paint, uh, Dr. Salvin von Prochocki, died, and he was the 18th known victim of radium poisoning. He had gotten sick handling radium paint with his bare hands um, to demonstrate the safety of this element to his workers. Um, author Claudia Clark has argued that government indifference to the Radium Girls campaign for recognition of radium poisoning, um, for compensation, and for prevention resulted from the influence of business. Um, it was more important for these companies to protect their profits than their workers' bodies. And as a result, women workers and women reformers actually formed this really effective coalition that proved this existence of a new industrial disease. Um, former dial painters, doctors, and lawyers all pushed for the government to thoroughly investigate this industry. In the wake of scientific findings attesting to radium's harm, they clamored for radium poisoning to join the ranks of the legally recognized industrial diseases. And at this point in time, there were only six legally recognized industrial diseases. Radium was not among them. Um, their biggest challenge lay in proving this link between their illness and the radium that they had been exposed to day after day. Um, and the case did draw attention to the need for government supervision and regulation of the use of radioactive substances, uh, worker health safeguards like protective materials and to the danger of radioactive materials. So on June 4th, 1928, the New Jersey women accepted an out-of-court settlement. Dial painters in other cities, such as in Ottawa, would be told by their companies that it was the element mesothorium, mesothorium that was the culprit in New Jersey and that their paint was safe to handle because it contained no mesothorium, only radium. And this claim would actually later be proven false. By 1935, um, Five Ottawa dial painters attempted to sue the radium dial companies, but they were halted by the statute of limitations. They did eventually win damages in 1938 though. Most importantly, the radium girls case established the right of individual workers to sue for damages from corporations due to labor abuse. So why does this matter today? Why is this still a topic that we should be educating the public about? Well, for one, radium has a half-life of 1,600 years. And what that means is that the surfaces coated with radium paint, such as watch faces and hands, have remained a health hazard long after their useful life is over. Radium was used in luminescent paint until the 1960s. Uh, the U.S. Radium Corporation site in Orange, New Jersey, was placed on the Superfund Program's National Priorities List in 1983. Um, after it was found to have a hazardous level of radioactivity. Um, there was also a site later found in Woodside, Queens, and 
for the radioactive materials that were removed from the clean site um, was believed to have the largest concentration of radium in the world. There was the equivalent of four ounces of radium in 2,000 to 3,000 vials formed into tiny needles found at the plant. So I first stumbled upon this story um, reading a book review by Sarah Olson of this book right here. And Olson wrote that Radium Girls is a tale of what happens when a corporation silences women and suppresses science. It's a caution against heedless belief in a substance we don't quite understand and an outcry against unjust treatment of innocent workers. So this story I feel like has not gotten enough attention in American classrooms and we really don't talk about it in daily life. Um, after all of the lawsuits, the Center for Human Radiobiology was developed to study the surviving dial painters. And some of them did survive into their 80s, but continued to suffer from almost honeycomb-like bones and other health issues. So between this book and the book review, it jogged memories of my own mother speaking about family history, and it launched me on this genealogical investigation because I knew the end of this story, but not the beginning. So here's a, a picture of Marion later in life. Marion's exposure to radium lingered in her body. And Marion was my great grandmother. Um, she died in 1976, suffering from Alzheimer's and aluminum deposits on the brain. Was her illness the result of radium exposure or exposure to another hazardous substance during her time working in um, the aircraft industry in um, the, the war effort? I, I will never find out definitively. But interestingly, um, Alzheimer's, aluminum, and industrial disease have all recently been linked in the case of a 58-year-old man uh, working in England in the preparation of insulation materials for nuclear fuel and space industries. Um, it is worth noting that Mary and son Robert and her daughter Alice have both independently attributed her decline and eventual death to her time at US Radium Corporation. Um, one thing that I will be always thankful for is that this project has really brought, brought together sides of the family who hadn't had contact with each other before, hadn't spoken about these topics. There is a terrible silence on these topics. Um, and that silence, that forgetting is purposeful. Marion did not like to talk to, about her time as a dial painter. Um, and later generations didn't know until we started working together to uncover this history. And it's an important history. Um, several of Marion's children, including my grandfather, suffered from cardiac illnesses, autoimmune disease, cancer, and passed way before their time. Um, is that linked to the, the radium dials that they had played with as children? I don't know if I'll ever be able to make that definitive um, to definitively just like decide that. Um, but family history is really the only way that I will ever get to meet my grandfather and his siblings and my great grandmother. And it's important that we realize that though radium dial painting was discontinued after World War II, the legacy of this industry still has a very tangible impact today on the bodies of the women they employed as dial painters, on the families they left behind, and on the environment. Uh, within the past few years, there has been a lot of new attention to this story, which is fantastic. Um, Kate Moore's book has been very popular. I definitely encourage you to check it out if you're interested in this topic. In 2018, a movie came out about the dial painters as well. Um, I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but I've heard good things. So hopefully it's a, it's a good picture of, you know, the story and their lives. So I'm open to taking any questions that you may have for me. Or any comments, <laughs> any personal connections. Erin, thank you. That was, that was good. I'd read the book. In fact, my book club had read it, and we were um, and just fascinated by the whole thing. Not in a positive way, but yeah. Um, it's a fascinating story. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, the question I had was on the um, buttons. Mm -hmm. Did it say poison on there? Um, this isn't a family photograph. I found this one on the internet. It does look like it says poison inside. Yeah. Um, I don't know if they thought that it would be safe since it was contained, um, or if this is just a later design than what the children would have been playing with. But yes, good spot. <laughs> a little telltale there. Um, the other thing is I remember as a kid in the 50s having alarm clocks that had green things that shine that shown what would shine at dark in the dark. Mm -hmm. That was no longer radium, was it? In the um, 50s? It could have been. Uh, they were being phased out. Uh, it was still used until the 60s. Okay. But I think by the 50s, people, you know, they, they were seeing the damage that was being done and they didn't want to continue that. Okay, just curious. Any Thank other you. questions? Yeah, actually, hi, this is Pam. Um, really nice presentation. Thank you. Um, I've read the book, but I remember um, I'm old enough that my, my grandfather telling me this story and my grandparents had a clock that most likely, now that I think about it, probably had radium because I, that's probably what caused him to tell me this story. I mean, this is like in the 60s, he told me. But was there any kind of initiative that you know of to get these things out of people's houses, especially if you know, they have that kind of a half-life because I'm thinking, you know, that clock could still be in somebody's somewhere in my family. Maybe my cousin's has it or something. So I don't, I don't think there was ever an initiative to get uh, these things out of people's houses. I think that um, from what I read, and I'm not an expert on that aspect of it. Um, I'm more um, invested in the history part. I don't know as much about the chemistry as um, I'd like to, but I think that you know, these are, people aren't ingesting um, parts of the clock that's hanging on the wall. So it doesn't have that same harmful impact that it would have if you were actually the one producing the clock. Um, is it healthy to have in the house? I'm not sure. There are a lot of different um, similar objects that people do keep in museums or in their houses still. I don't think it would be harmful um, for your family to be around, but I don't know enough to really caution you against it or or tell you it, that it's all right. Uh, but I don't think there were any like large scale um, government or private uh, initiatives to take these things out of people's houses. And I'm not quite sure where they would have disposed of them anyway. Um, many of these dial painting studios, once they were sort of bulldozed, became the suburbs. Um, so people were living over radioactive soil without even knowing it. So I don't, knowing that, I don't think that they would have um, ever made the move to sort of make more bureaucracy issues for themselves by taking them out of people's houses. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah, this is the librarian. Hi, can you see me or hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, this is Irene. Uh, thank you so much. I uh, really enjoyed it. I read the book and it, the one sentence you said here, there's not enough of this subject in uh, the classrooms. When I read this, I thought, how come I never heard of this before? And those women suffered horrible, awful conditions. And uh, it's really very important, their, their fight and the changes that they brought about. Thank, that's just a comment from me, no real question, but thank you so much oh, for your you. presentation. Well, if you ever have any other questions, you are more than welcome to get in touch with me. 
Um, my email is erinelizabecker at gmail.com. You're welcome to reach out um, with questions, comments, concerns, anything about the topic. I'd always love to answer. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. I really enjoyed it as well. Um, and I haven't read the book yet, but I it's on my <laughs> list. So it's a good one. There are there are photographs in the middle that are a little <laughs> they're a little bit graphic. So just prepare yeah. yourself. But it's a really good read, and the author is fantastic. Um, the way that she portrays this narrative is it's so moving, and I know I couldn't put the book down. Um, yeah. And it, it was a bit of a long one too. So I really, I really just read through the whole thing, but I definitely recommend it. I do have another question. What's been the reaction of your family as you've approached them about all this? You know, it has been, I, I would say it's been twofold. Um, there's horror there, of course, because you never want to be confronted with the suffering of past family members or the reality that it could still impact you. But on the other side, I think there's such validation among um, her grandchildren. So like my mother, for example, who lost her father very, very young um, to cardiac illness. As I uncover more, she gets more validation about the things that he told her about his mother, about his childhood. I've been speaking with my great uncle and doing these oral histories and it's like meeting the closest thing I'll ever get to my grandfather. And it's, it's reforming bonds between my mother and him and cousins that moved away. So it, it's been very rewarding. Good. Very good. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Well, that's all I have for us tonight. <laughs> all right, well, thank you very much. If no one has any more questions, um, that's it, we'll see you. Hopefully at our next program, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thank Have you. a wonderful night. You too, thanks.